Thanks, Jeff, and uh, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. We're going to turn the lights down here so we don't get in the way of your slap or your nap this morning, and so you can see the board. As Jeff said, my name is Dave Bishop. I farm 400 acres uh, uh, around between Bloomington and Springfield, about the center of the state. We produce uh, row crops, corn, soybeans, oats, wheat, alfalfa, vegetable crops. Uh, eggs, pork, and beef. <coughs> um, if I were, and, and you know, sometimes I guess the way to start this is by saying I do have people come to me sometimes and say, you know, I got a corn soybean farm, and uh, what I want to do is I want to transition that to an organic corn soybean farm. What inputs do I need to use? And I have to tell you right off that I have no idea how you do that. You will have to find somebody smarter than me. Because one of the principal and most important things in, in organic production is diversity. If you have to pick a common theme throughout, that's what it would be, diversity. Uh, and it's kind of an old idea my grandfather uh, would say, you know, the Hail can come along and knock the corn down, but it won't kill the cows. So if I've got cows, I've got something else to mitigate that loss. And I remember a lot of times in uh, October, the uh, windstorm would come along and it kind of knocked the corn down before we got to taking it. Then you went in there with an old M-mounted, front-mounted picker on an M, which only got about two-thirds of it under ideal condition. Then you kind of got what you could. And then you turned the hogs in and they cleaned up the rest. There was no law. And you had a diversity of income. You didn't have everything depending on the price of grain, but you had some diversity in, in it as well. And that is really what is necessary to make this system work. It's to have a diverse farm. <coughs> And this I'm going to give you as my particular opinion. But in my view, if you are to farm sustainably, organically, both plants and animals are required to, make, to provide the ecosystem services that nature requires to maintain a healthy farm ecosystem. You can't just go out and start spraying for this and spraying for that. We have to find other ways to maintain ecosystem services, and that requires both plants and animals to be part of that system. So what do we mean by ecosystem services? <coughs> well, organic system, but the way you address those issues is what's going to be different. Fertility, for example. In a conventional system, we tend to think of feed the crop. We put fertilizer on, so many pounds of fertilizer to get the yield goal that we hope to make. In organic system, we think in terms of feed the soil and let the soil feed the crops. We become very concerned about the soil biology and how good a job this soil is able to do in order to feed that crop. Weed control. It's not, what do I spray to kill this? Organically, we may begin actually by asking ourselves if we see if we've got a particular weed problem in the field, why is that weed there? <coughs> if, for example, this year we had a lot of foxtail, what does that tell you? Well, probably that you've got anaerobic soil condition. <clears throat> if you had water standing for weeks on end, you had anaerobic soil conditions, and that favors that particular weed. Well, if you have uh, soil compaction issues, tight soils run together, how do you fix that? Well, typically, we rip it, chisel plow it, and you can do that, that's kind of a quick fix. But, doing that will have a whole series of other implications in the terms of soil biology. Diseases, insects, cereal rye, for example, plants in the mustard and, and brassica family, like tillage radishes, are good at addressing compaction. They secrete chemicals in the soil that suppress various diseases and pathogens. All of these things <coughs> work to provide the ecosystem services in a way that does not damage the soil biology, but rather 
it enhances the soil biology. In natural systems, relationships develop between plants and especially mycorrhizal fungi in the soil. This network is what transports nutrients to the soil, transports to the plant, sends carbon back from the plant to the soil. When you farm for many years with just water soluble fertilizer, you're bypassing the system in the soil. <coughs> and like anything that you don't use, you lose. So we begin here with how do we get that engine up to speed in, in the soil biology. One thing we need to do, of course, is to figure out where we are. Now you, uh, I'm, everyone's familiar with soil tests. That tells you what's in the soil. You can maybe even combine that with tissue tests to figure out whether what's in the soil is getting in the plant. But what about the biology of the soil? How well is that biology functioning? What balance of organisms do we have? The balance between our bacterial and our fungal? What's there and what amounts and how well is that working? Well, we need to do some analysis to find out. What tools can we use to build the biology of the soil? Again, the diversity of plants and animals. We're going to use extended crop rotations. And I would say at a minimum, we're looking at adding a small grain to the rotation if you're currently corn and soybean. If you can add a legume or hay to that, extend it even farther, so much the better. Cover crops are just fundamental to making the system work, as are an appropriate amount of livestock inputs. And we'll talk a little bit more here in a minute about how we go about providing those things. Another issue is simply keeping every acre on the farm busy all year round. Imagine uh, if the CEO of Ford came on TV tomorrow and said, you know what, we're going to run a car plant five months this year and then we're going to let it sit there idle for a second. And you think, well, that's nuts. Why would you want to do that? Well, why would you want to have your most expensive asset, your land, making effective use? of the assets that you're already paying for. And we also want to figure out how that we can integrate livestock and grain production to build a sustainable system on all our acres. It's not just the cows are in the pasture here, the hogs are in the barn there, and the crops are in the field here. Let's spread them all out, make them work everywhere. Putting those cows on the, on the row crop acres it's one of the best ways to build soil and to build income at the same time. What you're looking at here is a, uh, a field of wheat that was uh, cut about two weeks ago. It had a seeding of red clover frost seeded into it, and we're now in the process of double cropping that with beef. And actually, we're going to try to make three crops out of that field. One of the problems with wheat or small grains uh, oats or whatever. In Illinois, it's typically that it just doesn't perform on a basis on a par with corn and soybean. It's just hard to get the same income from wheat that you could get with corn and soybean. But I want that small grain. I need that as part of my ecosystem service in providing soil fertility. So how can I make that acre of wheat pay on a par with an acre of corn and soybean? Well, we'll look at specific numbers here in a second, but we're going to do it with multiple use, multiple crops. Three practices I think are fundamental to making this kind of system work. Cover crops, nutrient management. It's a different kind of nutrient management than you would be accustomed to if you were farming conventionally. But it's important to have a plan for how you're going to manage the nutrients. And of course, drainage water management. <coughs> Nature Conservancy tells us that in the tile drained areas, 70% of the nutrient loss is through the tile. It's not just water that we're talking about here, we're talking about a lot of nutrients that are also in the water. Why anybody opposes efforts to reduce agricultural runoff is completely beyond me. 
because that's your money going down the, down the creek, literally. Why would anyone not want to take every possible step to reduce their input costs and hold on to what they've already paid? But for some reason, we uh, sometimes still see people that uh, are offended by the idea that they may be losing money. Cover crops? Cover crops do all kinds of things. You're going to hear a lot more about that today. Increasing the soil tilt and the porosity of the soil, sequestering nutrients, adding nutrients, in the case of legumes particularly, of course, presenting, uh, preventing erosion, keeping that ground covered. Increasing the organic matter, sequestering <coughs> <clustered> carbon, <coughs> weed and pest uh, and soil-borne pathogen and disease control, compaction. These are all issues that we're addressing with cover crops. Best way to, to uh, really learn about cover crops and what they will do, there's field days all over the, all over the country, <coughs> probably some near you, go to them. Get to know other people in your area that are using cover crops so that you can, you can have somebody to talk to. We have a, uh, a series of plots on our farm operated by the University of Illinois looking at 18 different species of cover crops, what they do and what effects they have on the biology of the soil. That kind of research is starting to pick up and is one of the most valuable things I think that, uh, that we can do in terms of getting a handle on what exactly these things do and to figure out what exactly are they worth. If I can tell you very precisely what my legume that was planted, uh, frost seeded, it was in the ground 18 or 15 months, it got to such and such a height. All right, well, how much nitrogen did I put in here? If I know that number, then it makes sense in my management system. Drainage water management again. Uh, control valves. I see a lot of pattern tile uh, going in uh, around here. Hundred thousand dollar jobs, seven hundred fifty bucks. We'll put a control valve on and manage the whole system. You're going to spend a hundred grand and not manage the system. Why would you do that? You need to manage both the water. Sometimes we want to get rid of it. Sometimes we want to hold on. To it. And the nutrients in the water with cover crops, all year round we can be taking those nutrients out of the soil and holding on to it. All right, leveraging cover crops. And when we talk cover crops and all these other uh, management techniques, we are talking about something that we intend to use both agronomically and economically. Both are important part of sustainability, of course, is not going broke. And not going, letting the soil go broke or the bank account go broke. So let's look at a, a few specific examples of how we can leverage cover crops to accomplish both things. And I, uh, this is just an example from 2012, and I picked that year because that was a tough one for us. We, we had a pretty serious drought in 2012, and so everything showed up a lot more so than necessarily would. And it looks like that slide might be a little bit messed up here. But essentially, going back to that wheat field in 2012, and in this case, we're just talking about 22 acre plot. We had 40 bushel wheat in there. Uh, organic wheat was selling $9 a bushel in 2012, so we had $360 of total gross income. Not very impressive uh, for an acre of ground in Illinois, but if you add uh, the second crop here, 15 stocker calves, we grazed them 80 days. They gained uh, three pounds a day on that red clover. $1.95 is our sale price for cattle. We market our cattle direct, usually in halves or holes or quarters, and at that particular time, uh, the price was $1.95 a pound live weight. So that added almost doubled. It added another $320 to that acre of ground. And then, of course, we're going to grow a crop of fertilizer. I'm thinking here simply in terms of the nitrogen. Obviously, it produced more than that. Uh, but uh, we calculated at 120 units per acre. And using anhydrous price at that time at 50 cents a unit, we had another $60. So by having this diversity, we were able to increase the value of that acre from $360 to $740. Dollars. 
and at the same time provide a diverse income stream. We don't just rely on the grain market, but we also have the, the beef market as well. Grazing after corn. Now notice that uh, Wheat Acre provides grazing through the latter part of the summer, not part of the summer when pastures tend to dry up. But we're also going to keep those cows out there after harvest. So we want to get ahead of the, we want to add some value to that cornfield. And at our latitude, central Illinois and obviously for northern <coughs> Illinois, that means we got to get that cover crop on there before the, com the corn comes out, because there simply isn't enough time otherwise. And when that, when we go in there with a the combine, we want to see something green on the ground and growing. In this case, we put on a bushel of rye, 20 pounds of oats, and three pounds of tillage rations. We are grazing this with the assumption of one animal unit per acre. They were gaining about 1.7 pounds per day, same value. We grazed either 60 or 90 days, depending on conditions. Uh, the cover crop, total cost of loan on, in this case is $48 an acre, and that added an additional two to $300 of gross income or 150 to 250 net, just by having the, the livestock on the field. And that doesn't include all the other benefits of the cover crop, that's just uh, the value of work. This is what we'd like to see when the combine rolls. We'd like to see that ground already up and growing, and as soon as that uh, combine gets through there, we can fence that off and get the cows in there, and they're going to have some, some good late fall and winter grazing. Managing these nutrients. In this case here, we've got a good stand of uh, alfalfa in this particular case. It's about 16 inches tall. We're going to incorporate that with a tiller. <coughs> now, several things that we want to do in terms of incorporation. We want to chop that material up. We don't want to just flip it upside down on the plow. We want to chop it up. And we want to incorporate that into a very shallow layer of soil. Not more than four inches less if we can. And leaves a pretty decent seed bed, but a couple things are going to happen. First of all, when you put that much organic matter in a very shallow layer of soil, it's going to heat up. It's going to get hot. In fact, it might get hot enough you wouldn't want to put your hand in. Now that's going to help reduce some of the weed and disease pressure there. It's going to kill some of those organisms. It's also going to create a nice warm seed bed for that corn crop to get started in. This is light soil, tends to be slow warming up anyway. If I time it right, and then I wait until that temperature peaks and begins to decline, I can plant my corn in there and get that corn out of the ground quick. So that's what I really want to do, I want to get up and going. Now, most of this crop is going to mineral. Very little of this will become long-term soil building material. This is spread and fertilizer, right? This is the fertilizer for the next crop. And that's half of what I want to do. I want to feed, and feed the crop, obviously. But I also want to build some long-term soil. Uh, I want to build, get some humus, get some humoric materials in the soil, sequester some carbon, and uh, increase my organic matter. That's where the brown manure part comes in. I'm going to use this combination of both green manure and brown manure. Some of this will mineralize, but a lot of this is going to become long-term stable organic matter. And that's the second half of building soil and providing fertilizer for next year's crop. Both are necessary. If you just have one or the other, the system's not going to work very well. Now this is compost. You can use raw manure if uh, that's what you want to do. Three advantages to using compost. First of all, it stabilizes those nutrients. They won't be as likely to leach. It also heats up enough to kill your, your weed seed, your diseases, pathogens in the soil, so you don't just reapply those to the land. And it also reduces the total bulk that you're going to apply in the fields by two-thirds. It's going to save a lot of trips to the field. So there's a, there's a lot of good reasons to take that step. Now you can do that one of several ways. Uh, you can get in there with a the bucket loader and push it up in a pile and then turn the pile and move the pile and bust around the thing all summer. 
And do a lot of work if you want to, or you can just put some pigs in there and it'll do it for you. Free of charge, and uh, you get a bacon bonus at, at the other end. In this case here, this is the winter feeding area for the cows. We're going to put the back on pasture, let's say in May. We're going to put the pigs in there. They'll make, they'll turn it all into good compost by November. Uh, we'll sell them off at that point, and then uh, the cows will be able to go back on that area again. We have to be able to measure if we're going to have a good nutrient management plan which essentially is just a play to manage and evaluate the health of the soil, including the amount, form, placement, retention, and timing of those nutrients that we're applying. In this particular case, uh, we're doing some measuring. We put a 10-foot square tarp on the ground, drove over it, and spread it. We're going to uh, collect the material that falls on that tarp and weigh it, do a little bit of math, and we come up with, uh, since there was 25 pounds in the bucket, we've applied about five and a half tons to the acre. Now our goal, long term, is to add at least a ton per acre each field each year. I can't drive fast enough to spread one ton per acre with my spreader and still stay on the track. But since my primary goal here is long term soil development, if I get uh, buy this field once every four years, I'm still within my one ton per year. And that helps uh, uh, spread my workload as well. Now, if you got more manure, by all means. Uh, if I had more, I would certainly use it. But this is what I've got to work with. And so that's basically what I'm using. Are there any questions thus far here? We're going to kind of shift to a marketing mode right now. Anybody got any thoughts, comments, questions? What was the timing of your cover crop in your corn, in your standing corn? When did we put it on? Right. We'd like to see half of the leaves dead. Repeat the question. Okay, when did we fly the cover crop into the standing corn? And again, uh, whenever you have about half of the leaves ready. You had a picture you were chilling in alfalfa. When did you plant that alfalfa? That could either, this in that particular slide, it was a field that had been in alfalfa three years. But we would use the same principle if we had that red clover that the cows were grazing after wheat. Uh, that would be tilled in the following spring. So you plant one spring, then till in the following spring. Mm -hmm. Right. Unless we're going to leave that field and, and leave it for a long period of time. But in your three crop rotation where you're corn, soybeans, and let's say wheat, then you would frost seed the red clover or alfalfa into the wheat the previous spring or winter, usually in February. And uh, then that would be terminated the following May. You get a good cover already by May? No, the next year. Oh, well, you're May, after, yeah. the next year. Yeah. Right, and we grazed it. Yes? Are you interested in beans, soybeans too? We do not, and the reason for that is we follow the soybeans with wheat. But, yes, you can obviously do that. Sir? Are you using rye grass or cereal rye for your cover? We're using cereal rye. In our area, and again, this varies with where you are, so you need to talk to people who are close by to figure out just exactly which cover crops work best. In our area, we've tried dozens of different cover crops. Cereal rye and red clover are our two most consistent performers. So we tend to rely on those, although we do use some mustard crops uh, for specific reasons, and in a vegetable production we use a greater variety. But year in, year out, our most consistent performers in cover crops are red clover and cereal rye. Was there another Okay, moving on to market. If you uh, Google, where is the profit in the food system? What you'd find is about 15% of the profit in the food system goes to the producer of raw material. And about 85% goes to the people who value add and market those raw materials. So let's look at value adding and marketing. 
and not just think of ourselves as people who grow stuff, but people who add value to what we grow and connect with our, <coughs> our money. Generally speaking, the closer you get to the consumer, the more profitable you are. Direct retail is obviously the most profitable, but there are any number of steps in between that might work for you where you can add a significant amount of value. So in this picture here, we've got two bins. We've got a grain bin in the background. We can just put it in there, load it on a truck and haul it off. And we've got a hog feeder in the foreground. We can market the grain in that bin any number of different ways, depending on what is most profitable. If we have the diversity on the farm to do so, we have lots of options. The less diversity we've got, well, the fewer options we've got. So let's suppose now that we want to uh, <coughs> put that uh, grain into a pig. Raising on conventional market, conventional grain, conventional prices. Uh, time I put this together, hogs were $38. If I, I got a 280-pound hog and I've got $80 of the feed costs, but I get a whopping 26 bucks for that pig, and then that doesn't include you know the other stuff that goes into it. But let's say now for a moment that I want to add value. I want a value add, but I don't want to mark. I want to let someone else do the mark. So I certify organic. And I've got an organic green, I've got an organic pig, and let's say I contract with Organic Valley to market. Well, at the same uh, weight, they pay $1.90, that was the 2015 uh, price, it was $1.90 a pound carcass weight. Feed cost gone up, that organic feed cost more. But still, $213 is better than 26 But let's suppose that now I, I want to go all the way here. I want to value add and I want to market. I'm going to move this pig into a retail market. And usually we're talking about Selling it as halves, I haul it to the locker, you come pick it up, you pay me for the pig, you pay the locker for the processing, direct retail marketing. Well, our price over the last three years has been $2.75 a pound, correct weight, and we're cheap. In this area, I did some research, I find in $3.50 to $4.50 it's more common in the Chicago area. So that $2.75 sells pigs. Fairly easily. And at the same feed cost, I've now bumped that up to $386 for a pig. So by value adding, I can add $186 to that thing. By value adding and marketing, I can add $360 to the price of that thing. So what am I best paid for doing? Well, anything but raising the pig. If you are familiar with the AMA <coughs> marketing service, uh, when we look at, uh, at <coughs> selling organic grain, this is where we usually turn to see what the market's kind of doing. And I don't know if you can read this very well or not. Uh, <coughs> well, I can't even read it. So anyway, this was uh, end of the year 2015. Uh, make a note of uh, soybean prices here were, uh, what is that number, 24, 2174, this is down quite a bit from the last year. And also note that below that there's a line item there for roasted soybean, another way to market. And that's uh, going for $1,000 a ton. Okay. Back to this green bit for just a moment. Let's say this is uh, 7,500 bushel green bin. And let's, uh, let's ma uh, imagine for the sake of argument here that we're going to have, we're going to fill it full of soybeans. We're going to have 7,500 bushel of soybeans in that bin. What is the value of 7,500 bushel of soybeans? <coughs> well, Conventional beans into a conventional market, $8.68 a pound, makes that bin worth about $65,000. If I want to value add by certifying that as organic, I can add hundred grand to it real quick. That's a pretty decent value add. 
but I don't have to stop there. Let's say that uh, I take advantage of that roasting uh, market. Uh, $1,000 a ton translates into $30 a bushel. It's going to cost me a dollar to roast them. I can add some more value. I can bump that value of that van up to $217,000. It's going to be a little more work. The question is, how well am I paid for the work that I'm doing? Well, let's uh, add some more value. The livestock, uh, our calculations is that that will bump the value of that soybean up to around 60 cents a pound, adding, uh, bumping it up to about $270,000. Again, I'm going to do more marketing. It's a different way of, I've got to grind that feed, I've got to feed the pig, I've got to market the pig. I'm going to be doing more work, yes. But I'm being pretty well paid for that work. Now, for the sake of argument, let's imagine that you really want to get ambitious. You really, really want to do some work. And you're probably going to have to invest, you know, 100000 in infrastructure, uh, probably. Maybe you want to hire a marketing consultant, but you really want dollars and 19 cents a pound. And there's 450,000 pounds of beans in there. So what is that been worth? Well, somewhere between 65,000 and a million three, depending on what you decide to do. In any case, it's what, 150 acres of beef. Value adding and market. Questions on that? Do you roast your own beans? We do not. We roast them in our Okay. But there are uh, Wisconsin sliding roasters in the city. <coughs> who roasts beans in Arthur? Mm -hmm. Who who roasts your beans? Stutzman's feed. Oh, really? <laughs> Any other questions? I'm going to talk a little bit then about dealing with adversity. This is some tough time shaping up right now. Sometimes diversity is the markets. Sometimes diversity is the weather. Sometimes diversity is all the above. This was our uh, main pasture in late June of 2012. Now, you don't have to be a cattleman, an expert in anything, to know that there isn't supposed to look like that in June. That was. And we were trying to... We knew we were going to face some tough choices. We could sell the cows. Everybody was selling cows. Cows were coming out of the West in droves. We could buy that $600 ton hay that was floating around out there, supposedly. That was going to be a little bit hard on the budget. Now, if I sold the cows, I took a beating, and also I messed up my whole production system, didn't I? I really didn't want to do that. What I wanted to do was find a way to keep those cows. Now, fortunately, we had uh, that field of wheat that we had seeded red clover in. So come along uh, early July, we usually kept around the 4th to 10th of July. We got that wheat off. We had somewhere to go with those cows for the rest of summer. That, of course, did not necessarily fix the winter. But we were at least able to hold off starvation <coughs> by grazing that cover crop. The cover crop made it possible to keep the cows <coughs> to the summer, to the growing season. But then there's the wind. Well, not too far away uh, from this picture, there's a bottom field, 40 acres of corn, that uh, at tosseling time was not showing any evidence it was going to produce an ear. And when the tossel comes out and there's no ear present, you start to get suspicious that there could be a problem. And it was plain that there was going to be a problem. So I had this nice big six foot, uh, eight foot stalk of green corn out there with no ear. Now if you're a grain farmer, let's call the crop fill. If you happen to be feeding grass finished beef, that's called a bonanza. So there is a possible I wanted to 
inside, basically round bale and wrap that cornfield for my winter feed. <coughs> Two problems. Crop insurance. Am I going to lose my crop insurance? Well, I call up the, the crop insurance guy and I explain what he, what I wanted to do, and I ask him, uh, you know, is that okay? And he had absolutely no idea. <laughs> and it took about a week. He finally did call me back, and he said, "Well, they say leave six rows stand through the field so we can verify there's no ear." Okay. Okay, great. Second problem: nitrate toxicity. Dry year, you can get some problems with too much nitrate. <coughs> so we uh, went out there and we pulled some stalks. We cut out about a six inch piece of the stem above the root, threw in a few leaves, sent it off to the lab for analysis. It came back with an acceptable range. My neighbor raises, uh, he's a dairyman, raising conventional corn, a lot of soluble nitrogen, didn't turn out so lucky. His was pretty high. <clears throat> when you use organically natural sources of nitrogen, those kinds of things <coughs> seem to be far less of a problem than we're using a lot of soluble nitrogen. So there you got it. We uh, bailed that up. The cows, uh, the cover crops made it possible to keep the cows. The cows made it possible to salvage what had otherwise <coughs> looked like a failed corn. Diversity in economic survival. The more diversity you've got, the more options you've got. The better, the better you are able to utilize the things that you grow. And that is basically what you're trying to accomplish with the organic system. Question.